I'm sharing today from uh, a couple, a married couple. They're called Karen and Tejas, Tejas Monteverdi. I met them at an ashram upstate called Yoga Society. Um, it's Ananda. And I was also, after meeting with them, would go and research on Instagram or other places online to find out about these topics. So first of all, when there's shifts in polarity, it's it requires calibration, differing degrees of same energy field. And it's my attraction, repulsion that causes it, whatever the thing, person, or experience is to be magnetized. There is, um, when there's feeling lack of abundance, it means that we're in the field of already because now we only have to choose the polarity to become attractive and not repelling. For example, we say I'm in the field of abundance, but I have very little. It's the same thing as saying I'm in the field of temperature, but there, it's very hot or it's very cold. There's not a lot of heat, but there's, there, we're in the field of abundance. There's just not a lot of abundance. So, um, basically, um, for example, love and hate are on the same um, spectrum. It's like shades of like or dislike. So, for example, um, when we're somewhere in between that shades into each other, it can be points that um, we might be at a loss but we can control our perception, which means that we can use the emotional information as a barometer of how cold or how hot. Subconsciously, we have thoughts that we can heed um, and, and direct how we um, how we hold. In other words, these thoughts that we hold are... Um, going to direct how we think, how we feel, how we behave, and how we emote. So our brain wiring is from the underlying commitments that we have that have become automatic, like auto commitments, auto, auto, automatic programming um, through this input of directives. The question is, what are my original agreements that are causing me confusion, distress, pain? What makes me susceptible to perhaps abuse or unhappiness is that I've already suffered what I'll never heal from and is some way my fault. I find it hard to speak up in the moment or stand up for myself. And I want to say I wrote this probably um, six years ago. Um, it could be more. Could be more. Anywhere five to seven years ago, I really don't know exactly, and possibly even more. So, and and I say that to say that it's I'm still working on it. So, these things that I I'll never heal. This is a belief that I'll never heal. That there's something I'll never heal from, and that it's in some way my fault. And that when I find it hard to speak up in the moment or stand up for myself, it's because I don't know how to create healthy boundaries. And the belief that my integrity level is high, but I'm very dismayed if it's ever questioned. Um, the belief I work hard to sustain a sense of security and I avoid situations that could threaten it. A belief that I'll deep down only be loved for my effort or accomplishments and unconsciously feel only others can love and care for me if I attend to their needs first. The belief that I'm supposed to be hard on myself and unhappy with my achievements, so I'll be better. Um, the belief that I see myself as an empath and I can put others' problems and needs first instead of sorting my own out and still be okay. The belief in my own unlovability, the lack of boundaries that I'm not allowed to express, that I'm a bad seed, that I'm evil, that I'm blamable, that I'm the one who is blamable and that everything, excuse me, is my fault and I'm going to end up alone because people would be happier if I was gone, if I was gone. Or that I should be ashamed of asserting boundaries or that I have to appear in a specific or special way or that I'm obstinate or the desires which seem, which I think are legitimate are really in actuality invalid, rebellious, or defiant, or that I'm a sponge, a leech, a bulldozer, difficult, lazy, that I eat too much, that my privacy and safety really doesn't matter. But emotions are tools, and when we're stuck in the spinner vortex of emotions, we have to figure out what it is first. So for example, with a cup, is it ceramic or plastic or paper? No one knows more, you know, 
than one like knows their self. So in other words, I know me, like no one knows me better than I know me. You just need to take the time to know me. Everything you want to learn, you have to take time to study. You want to learn about botany, about neuroscience, about makeup. You take time, you invest, you make effort. So here we know emotions are not good or bad. They're on a spectral scale and they're a barometer of information. So these tendencies and patterns, you know, in, in the place where I was staying, they had these words, um, you know, I like to use the Hebrew words. They resonate with me, but they like to use Sanskrit words. They call them vasanas. They're bundled together, the patterns. And then they said, what are they bundled with? Samskaras. Which are, these are like a previously agreed to thing. I like because like it has scar in it. So I think of scar tissue, like not necessarily a wound that's open on the outside, but something that became hard. Um, for example, when I remember learning in body work and anatomy and physiology and a massage, if someone has a wound in a muscle, like um, overstretched or something, then when it is not used for a while and it's not getting blood flow through it while it's healing, it could become harder. It's a kind of wound that is from the pattern of staying stiff. So some sort of pattern where we stay too rigid, this previously agreed to thing, thought or emotion, in other words, it goes from thought like it's this previously agreed to thing, which then lead, this is a pattern now, right? The next pattern is the thought. The next pattern is the emotion. The next part of the pattern is the judgment. Then there's a pattern of oh, desire because of the judgment. There's a pattern to the actions. So one, we have to look in, looking in really, look at where it came from. And two, looking at the agreement with it that we have kind of now we're looking at it as if it's separate like so first we look in find it then we look at it like okay I see you what, what are you why, why is this a bad pattern or a tendency like why is this a bad program to run through the associations become what we identify with causing us to be not liberated or not clear or not free since we become convinced and in other words we can't make choices we're just stuck in that pattern so we can't we're less mobile less flexible and we become convinced our happiness is external or dependent, pretty much, even though it was always within us all along. So when we change our habits, obviously we have to want to because then the rest of the process is to notice after we ran through the pattern again that we were moving from that scar, from that samskara, from that wound, from that stiffness. And then we notice right after it happens that, we, you know, like it gets closer to the point of choice. So first we'll notice like, oh my gosh, yesterday I did that. I did it again. I didn't give myself a chance to deep breathe when someone was grabbing my hand to dance with them and I wanted to like center first so that I could move from an organic place. Instead I had to copy her move she was telling me to do. I didn't like that. Then I can notice right after like today, someone was saying something and I said, I'm really like um, not wanting to engage with you but I, d I only noticed after the fact that um, this person was sort of invalidating me and I felt uncomfortable with it. And then there's something we can notice during, which is that while I was in a group, I was able to say, I'm getting overwhelmed. I need to pause. Like, I can't keep going on pretending I am keeping up. I We were doing group study. And it turned out everybody was actually needing a moment to calibrate, to integrate. And then there's a time we could no notice immediately prior to doing it. So... Um, you know, getting a phone call and then feeling like, um, you know, I wanted to get off the phone. I was able to say, I'm not feeling so well. And instead of lying about it, I said, I think I'm getting my period. It's mostly emotional. So before I would get into this isolating. And then finally we noticed in advance, like, so I know that tomorrow I have a lot of things planned, um, kind of one after the other. And then later on in the day, another thing right after the other. And then a bunch of things in between, so I don't want to force myself to do anything late tonight. I want to go to bed at a good time. And then whatever free time I have at tomorrow evening, I'll spend on this extra sort of thing that feels very important, but it's not urgent. So you see these patterns we're breaking slowly but surely are stiffness. Where we're stiff, we stretch a little. That's how like, let's say my shoulder feels a little tight. So that's the way that I could start to move in slow little circles, not like very dramatic but slowly, like in the shoulder, letting the shoulder move. So it's in the pattern, like in the place that
try it. Yeah, in the place that we have to move just slightly differently. Because these are our vulnerabilities. These are our insecurities. They're very related, vulnerability and insecurity correlated. We feel insecure in the places where we're not protecting. So we get hard, we get stiff in order to protect the vulnerabilities. These are places where we could get hurt. So we can choose to be less vulnerable in order to slow down enough to work with them. So instead of like keeping something in a state of having to be exposed to risk, we, like I just mentioned a few examples of different points in the process in different areas of life, by taking 100% responsibility, it might scare me, but to say, I'll show up for myself with all the patterns in the places where maybe I'm limited or where um, it's painful or it's uncomfortable, I'll be there for myself. I'll stop, slow down, find the trigger point in order to ask, is it true? If it is a perspective problem, I can ask myself, why is this my perspective? And if it's not true, I can ask myself, what would I rather believe and restrain my brain's pathways with, um, you know, really it's all about, tr I, I want to say like uh, in the restraining here, I really mean the word discipline. It's like we're training, we're training our minds these programs. So I guess my point is like, when when uh, when someone's vulnerable for attack, but they learn how to protect themselves or how to get enough energy, like if I would be very tired, I'd be very vulnerable to getting distracted, to being lethargic, to maybe relying too much on maybe food, sugar or caffeine or something like these choices. But if I plan ahead and I get enough rest, I'm taking responsibility for myself and then I'll feel more secure in myself and I won't be as vulnerable to moments where I have stretched too thin or don't have enough energy. So additionally, when we work on n knowing that nothing outside of us can hurt us, it is about our perspective. It's all from the inside and that we are the expert, each one individually on ourselves. that no one can protect us better than we can protect ourselves. Like then I won't deal with that person who grabs me to dance with them and follow their moves. If it happens again, I know that I just say, I could just grab them back and give them a hug and then continue walking. Like it's not necessary to engage in, like to learn new movements. It's not necessary to engage in the way just that's expected of me. And in these steps to empowerment, we can learn to trust the parts of us we didn't trust before and rely on the internal process instead of the external. So like there was somebody who was really violating boundaries, showing up unannounced, asking somebody who behaved extremely inappropriately with me in the past and they know that this person behaved like a predator, asking them for my address, getting them involved in my life. I said, this is not a gift anymore. You wanted to give me a present, but you didn't ask my address. You didn't ask permission to drop by. I just didn't feel like any of it was so appropriate. The boundaries, and I felt like this person is acting like violating and then writing to me like a little bit crazy things and told her husband they're not allowed to talk to me anymore because I think he mentioned my name once by accident. So this is where I could feel insecure and say like, oh, I'm a burden. I am unlovable, or I could say this reflects their their insecurity, and maybe my vulnerability is like this that insecurity is contagious, or that they're pressuring me, or they're trying to be a fake friend, you know, and a real friend maybe is it, it's based on respect and trust. So as I trust parts of me that I didn't trust, I could have relationships where people trust me, and also I could trust them, and. Some ways that we work on trust is self-hypnosis or it's really a meditation where you sort of get yourself into a state, a state of mind where you're open to suggestions, new suggestions that maybe you're more resistant to because of the fears of the vulnerabilities that have become automatic patterns. By you, I mean me or you. Um, writing, you see, I've been journaling for years. That's where a lot of this precious information comes from. Um, I put a lot of signs up on the walls, like small things in different places. Sometimes they're kind words, sometimes they're lists. Sometimes they're cute little things. Um, there's a big sign that says love is all you need. Um, and I also think like um, letting someone else like guide us into a hypnotic kind of state or to be open. And this, uh, and also creative visualization. Like I imagine myself well, I imagine what I want and we could use vision boards or um, Di like like uh, not the diagrams or di diagrams but like design or art like representations physical di um, and the word design has the word sign in it which is interesting and we have to remember all along emotions are energy in motion and energy contains the information so instead of getting this emotion which they say could be like trapped in this 
quick response to that emotion. Every time we do that autocorrect, we stiffen. We can start to be more fluid and the emotions can move also. And um, for anyone who's interested, I'm not going to go too much in it here, but we have like three major frequencies that she spoke about called the gunas. They're like the uh, three presets to the system in, in, in a school of thought. It's not agreed on with everyone. One of them is called Rajas, one of them is Satvik, and one is Tamas. So this just refers to one is sort of like a stable frequency. One is kind of like a low vibe, like low. And one is kind of like high frequency, very reactive. So we don't want to be like frozen and not able to move at all. And we don't want to be like so quick that we get like hyperextended. Like think of the joints. If they're too much, they're extra vulnerable. So either way, um, one is too stagnant, one is too reactive. We want to be somewhere in the middle. So these are just because she likes the Sanskrit words, but it doesn't matter what words you use. Um, have a great day. Bye.